I'm glad you're here tonight. I hope you're doing well. We are in the book of Exodus. We are on the ninth command, if you want to call it that, or the ninth word. And we'll deal with number 10 next week. So two weeks from now, our summer series will start. Michael Dublin will be our speaker for that one. Our, remember, our theme is for the summer series, uh, or the Beatitudes. So we're going to cover those. Uh, we've got uh, guest speakers every night as we normally do. Uh, Michael Dublin will be our first one. And that's in two weeks. And of course, he'll cover the poor in spirit. So if you hadn't had a chance, you can go ahead and start reading through the, the Beatitudes uh, as that will go in conjunction with our Sunday morning as we're going through the Sermon on the Mount some as well. Uh, but we're covering the Ten Commandments. Uh, going to finish up tonight with the ninth one and the tenth one next week. And then we'll be done uh, with our study through the book of Exodus for the time being. So uh, hopefully everybody's got a chance to turn there. Let's open up with a word of prayer. Father, you're very good to us, and we acknowledge that. We're thankful uh, for new mercy today, the opportunities that today came along with. We're thankful, Father, for the ability to move among this world and to be the salt of the earth, the light of the world, to be an influence for you and for your kingdom and for your cause. And as, as the events have unfolded within this past week, uh, uh, our society and, and our part of the world needs, it needs you. And it needs your light, and uh, you have given that task to us. And we pray, Father, that when it comes to our neighbor, when it comes to a stranger, when it comes even to our enemy, we shine the light of Christ. Uh, and that we exhibit his heart and have taken on his heart and his path and uh, are modeling that. And Father, we pray that as we embark on this study uh, with, uh, with through the Ten Commandments, these ten rules, these ten words... Uh, that even Jesus himself echoes them in the, in the New Testament as they have great application then for the children of Israel and great application for us as well, your spiritual Israel. And we're thankful for that. We're thankful for your word that endures forever. And we're thankful that your written word reveals the living word that is Christ himself. Bless our time tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So just a story to begin with and then kind of put into context with, with our... our uh, command that we're going to look at tonight. So the year is 1836, and the post office in New Salem, Illinois, was closed down. Uh, but it would be several years before a, a representative from the United States government could come and uh, check over the books, make sure that everything was taken care of. But finally, that agent arrived, and he found the postmaster uh, who was in charge of the New Salem post office, and he informed him that, according to all the audit and everything that he looked at with the books, uh, that the post office there, the postmaster, owed $17 to the government. $17. So it closed in 1836, and this is several years that passed. So the, uh, post, the ex-postmaster took the agent home with him, opened up a treasure chest that he had, uh, took out the blankets and everything that was in there, and there he had a small piece of paper, and it was wrapped in a yellow ribbon. And he unwrapped the yellow ribbon, unfolded the paper, and would you know that there were $17 in there. And this individual, he said he knew that that would probably be the case, that he would owe something. And he said, quote, this postmaster, he said, I never use any man's money but my own. Trying to indicate, you know, just honesty, truth, and so forth and so on. Anyone want to take a guess at who that ex-postmaster was of the New Salem, Illinois post office? Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln. You imagine that no matter what had happened, everything under your care, and knowing that you probably could have gotten away with it at that time, that you still find a way through honesty uh, and integrity and so many other things that you, you make sure that whatever is owed is there. And of course, you know his nickname as he, grab, uh, as he gravitated and grew over time, Honest Abe. So it gives you an idea of what uh, what kind of man he was and the character that he had. And, of course, that shaped him into becoming a president, one of the greatest, at least, historians consider. Well, Exodus chapter 20, in the ninth commandment, in verse 16, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. So before we get into this command, one thing that I would like to point out and then ask a question with it, just that becomes obvious, in verse 16 and 17, the word or the phrase, your neighbor, appears four times. Four times in two verses. It hadn't appeared in any other command, hadn't appeared in anything else. 
So why do you think as God is winding everything down with these ten rules and these ten words, if you want to call it that, why does he choose at this moment to emphasize your neighbor? What do you think? Just in general, not, not anything just off the top of your head, not, not adultery, not murder, not honoring your father and mother, though this is probably implied. But when it comes to false witness and it comes to coveting, he emphasizes your neighbor. So just in general, what do you think God's trying to communicate? What's he doing? Ma'am? Anybody? Anybody? Okay. The question is raised in the New Testament. And who is my neighbor? Okay. So later on, thousands of years later, the question will be raised. Who is my neighbor? All right. Scott? Well, he's addressing actions that have um, a real harmful effect to community. Ah. Yeah. So th these actions disturb neighborhoods, if you will. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that, that seems to be the consensus of scholars. So it's, it's not that they wouldn't disturb a home or anything like that, but you've got a person and his or her parents, then you've got a person and his or her wife, but you're still just confined to a very small amount of influence in an individual. But for whatever reason, these two, not that the others don't, but these two, what, if you didn't hear what Scott said, these are harmful. And I like the way that you put it, because they are, to the community as a whole. And Israel needed to know, and it's something that we've kind of forgotten in our day and age, we are not just an end to ourselves. We are part of a greater whole when it comes to society. And when we come to neighborhoods, and it comes to neighbors, and so forth and so on. And then, as you said, that expands to anybody. So this influence isn't going to just be between you and your mom and dad or you and your spouse. This is now an obligation or responsibility to anybody. Anybody. So uh, there are two ways that I want to approach this tonight. One is the actual context in which the false witness is in. And then I want to expand on that. And of course, we'll, we'll close with a, with a point of view from, uh, from, the, uh, from the New Testament. So where, what do you think this context would be in? This false witness. What is the context of this? Okay, court. Court. So this, if, if you want just to expand further, we're not going to have time to do it tonight. And obviously not next week. But if you want further study over the, the rest of the summer, you can read the rest of the book of Exodus. But in Exodus 23, 1 through 3, will be the idea of the judicial system. Will be the idea of the legal system for, for Israel. And as the Old Testament gets written, and as it gets developed under Moses and other prophets and so forth and so on, this word witness, this phrase witness, takes on not greater meaning, but greater depth in what's there. So you have false witness, which is mentioned here. And we kind of get the idea of what that would be. Uh, but you can have a witness without a cause. In other words, this is just a person who is just, I'm just there. Uh, can you think of an example in, an, in the New Testament where there were a bunch of people that all came to Jesus and they were dragging an individual to him and they were all labeling themselves as a witness to this person's infidelity? The lady. Now, do we really believe that everybody was there? All the men that were dragging her, all the Pharisees that were there, they were witnesses to that. The idea would be, Hopefully not. You wouldn't be that grotesque. It's possible. But the idea would be is that they are a false witness from the perspective of they are a witness without a cause. I wasn't there, but I will, I will say, I will portray myself. Am I making sense to you in that, that regard? And then there's this context in Proverbs where there can be a witness, but it's a person who is full of maliciousness. A malicious witness. A hostile witness, if you will. Crooked, worthless, you may see some of that. False witness is the idea of lying. So from the context of court, in a legal perspective, and that in general, what is God teaching Israel with this command? Do not bear a false witness against your neighbor. Again, keep it confined at the moment to the courtroom and to the legal system. I'm telling the truth. Do okay. not lie. All right. Yeah, so he is doing that. All right. Don't lie. Uh, but implied in that is always tell the truth, whatever it is. Okay, what else? The whole truth, not just the part that is on your side. Okay, okay. don't skew it. Don't leave. Uh, so what if, I, what if I'm telling you the truth, but I leave out pieces of that? 
uh, agenda, you have something behind. So if you didn't hear what Dennis, it's not just tell the truth, but then tell the whole truth that's there. Okay? What else? What else is God teaching Israel? Well, God's concern is justice. Uh, <coughs> without truth, there can't be any justice. All right. So we have the beginnings. Even though this word is not there, we have the beginnings of what the Old Testament will call justice. And justice takes on, it kind of blooms as the Old Testament goes. But if there's one place in a society where justice should be, where is that place? In a court of law, as we would say, right? If there's one place that that should exist, if it doesn't exist anywhere else in a society, if there's one place that it should exist, it should exist in a court of law because God cares about justice. And by the way, They've already been practicing these types of things. What was Moses doing to the point of exhaustion? You remember chapter 18? What was he doing? Okay, he's trying cases. He's making and rendering decisions. And of course, Jethro comes in and says, you're going to burn yourself out. You need to have all of that. So you almost have, even prior to the giving of the law, you have a legal slash judicial system in place. This just kind of reinforces it. This is not the beginnings of that. That's already started. This is a reinforcement of what should be brought in. What else is there? What else is God teaching Israel with this command? With, without, without that in a court, you have no court. Okay. Without that in a court, you have no court. Why is that? Ah. So if there is no truth, so if we go the other route, if, if truth is not being portrayed, if it's not being promoted, and it's the whole truth in all of its entirety, then the next logical thing that is eroded because of that is trust. Okay? What else is God trying to teach Israel with this? Without that kind of trust and honesty, you're, you're misrepresenting God. Okay, so remember, Israel's mission is still like ours. We're, we actually are just standing on their shoulders. We have the same mission to be a light to the nations. Uh, so if their judicial system, their judicial system is meant to be a light, their economy is meant to be a light, uh, the way they treat each other from the foreigner to the immigrant to their fellow Israelite, that's meant to be a light. So if, if your judicial system is not that way, that's just as much of a reflection on God as anyone else. They're going to be facing harsh situations. They've got to stick together. And when they reach the land of Canaan after 40 plus years or whatever, they're going to have to depend on each other for their lives in battle. Okay. All right. And if that trust, yeah, so if that trust is not there, can I trust my neighbor to be there for me or can he trust me or vice, whatever it may be? Uh, because you're right. They are still headed in a direction. Sinai is not the place. It is not the promised land. What else can you think of? Anything else? Why this would matter? Say I'm just going to throw out the word submission. Okay. Submission, submission to something greater than yourself. All right. It is a submission, something great. And in this case, it's the truth that is greater than me. Whatever me from a, it, with, you mentioned agenda a second ago, to something else. Something's got to be beyond me as an individual, and even beyond us as a community, and beyond us as a society. Um, if it's not truth, then what really do we have? Uh, so you mentioned the promised land. What are, what's the indictment of Israel in the book of Judges? Everyone did... Right? So there's no king in those days. It's kind of the idea there's no central figure. So everybody did what was right in their own eyes. Truth is what keeps us from doing what is right in our own eyes. Because truth is supposed to be objective. Okay? Is there anything else you can think of on what God is teaching Israel with this command? Don't bear false witness. Huh? Everybody's a neighbor. Ah. In other words, I might... I don't want to mistreat my neighbor, but I surely don't want them to mistreat me. Okay. And we know that's what the law of the prophets hang on. Jesus said, treat and love your neighbor. 
your neighbor as yourself. Yes, yes. And just like you said, everybody's the neighbor. So when you come into the court of law, when you come into that judicial system, and it needs to be there, because you've got to settle things. It's just going to happen. Think about this again. Israel is already having to settle cases along the way. Moses is already having to settle things. It's just the way that it is. If we can't come to a central place where an objective settlement, whatever it is that needs to be settled, can't be settled, what kind of society do we have? Chaos, which is the same thing we've been saying over and over and over. If you have parent, if you have children who openly, adult or children by virtue of age, if they openly rebel and dishonor their parents, what kind of society do you have? If you have people murdering, just whatever, left and right, what kind of society do you have? If you have marriages constantly being broken, what kind of society do you have? Right? The list goes on and on, and every time I've asked that for the last five weeks, you have said over and over and over, chaos. Go ahead, Scott. Another thing he's teaching them is something about himself. Ah. I mean, all of his laws teach them something about how he sees things. Good point. What his nature is. Yeah. So, so in this case, what is, he, what is he teaching about himself? Down to he is one. Ah. I think. Okay. He's one. He's not, he doesn't change. And that has to do with truth. Mm. Yeah. So he doesn't change. And of course, all of that is on, is built on the foundation that he is truth. It's not just that he has it, that it's God. And then truth is over here. Something hasn't, no, it's embodied in him as much as love is, uh, kindness and so forth and so on. Yes, ma'am. You know, as a child, learning the Ten Commandments, I always learned but as an adult, as I reread this, I always found it interesting that that's not what it says. Although we understand that, you know, it's the father's lies and the, the lying of the sin. I say that hesitantly because I'm not completely convinced. That sounds weird. But um, it says do not bear a false witness. Why does it not say do not lie? One question. Mm -hmm. And when we think about lying as sinful, I stumble on that sometimes because I think, is it really the telling of a falsehood that's the sin or is it the motivation? And the reason I say that is because I think if I were living in Nazi Germany and I were hiding Jews in my house mm -hmm. and the Nazis came to my door and said, are you hiding Jews? I would lie. I would lie. Mm -hmm. Would I go to hell for that? So it's an interesting ethical dilemma to think about. It is. Is lying an absolute sin, or is it um, the motivation and the deceit that is a sin? Mm -hmm. And when we say there are lies of omission, that if you're not telling the whole truth, that's wrong, I stumble on that as well. Mm -hmm. So when I'm at work and I take a patient to the treatment room, <coughs> Today, even, I had this 80 pound dog trying to trim its snails and it tried to bite me and tried to kill the staff. We had a problem. But I go back to the room, I don't tell the owner, your dog is a horrible thing and we, we, it really needs to be put down. No, I don't say that. I say, it's fine, we trimmed your dog's snails. I'm so glad to see you and meet your dog. Did I lie? Well, did I tell the whole truth? I did not. Should I have? I don't think so. So, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, you No, it's it is. And you bring up things that are dilemmas and situations and things like that that test. And I mean, the, the one that we always have is, of course, uh, you know, um, Rahab. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. I was about to say Hagar, but poor Hagar's got enough honor. Uh, Rahab. Is, right. She's in the lineage. Yeah. So I, what I will not, I, and it's hard to say one way or the other because we can't speak for God on that. She's going to have to answer for that. And she's going to have to answer for the decision that it is. You'll have to give an answer. Why did you do this and the motivation? And whatever that motivation is, that's going to be between her and the Lord. And we don't believe in situational ethics. You know, yeah. we don't even write wrong. But right. 
Even no. Nazi German situation. Oh, no. I, no, it is. <laughs> now, now part, of this, part of this goes with the false witness. The idea within the judicial system is, I know you and I have, there's a wrong, whatever that wrong is. And I am going in there with every intent to not be the one guilty. So if I need to lie to get myself out of that, I don't really care that you're my neighbor. You're just in the way of self-preservation. So whatever I got to say, whatever I got to do, I will say and I will do. That's the idea behind this. Uh, at the same, I mean, but at the same time, at the core of false witness is somebody who plans. We're going to look at this from, from a proverb in a minute with Proverbs 6. The idea is that it's layered. It's multi-layered. So you're, you're bearing false witnesses out in the open. Right? You just kind of know. Everybody knows that. But underneath that is the lie. I, I know what I'm going to say. So I've already determined what that lie is. The false witness is just me bringing it out in the open. But underneath that is the plan to lie. And underneath that is the motivation of self-preservation or whatever it is. I mean, so you're looking at a multi-layered type of thing. And when we look in just a second in Proverbs 6, that there are six things that the Lord hates and seven are an abomination to him. One is a lying tongue, and then the other is false witness. Because the idea is that it's, it's, it's just a progression, and this is what sin does. Uh, and we're going to see what the New Testament will do, is that if we're committed to speaking the truth, we're committed to the way of Christ and speaking the truth, then we'll do that, no matter how hard that may be. But are there times where you're going to have to think and make a decision and live with that decision. No one will have to give an account. Yeah, that's, that's there. And it can't, can't do that. So I see numerous hands, so we're going to go around very quickly. We'll start with David, and then we'll just make a circle around. So just hold on to that. Go ahead. Another perfect, perplexing example, and I know you needed one more, yeah. was uh, David in 1 Samuel 27. I think it's 1 Samuel. It might be second. With Achish. When he was living with the Philistines, he told them that he was raiding Israel. Sure. Israeli towns, but he was not. Yeah. He was lying to Achish. I think the, the thing that we have to do when keeping with the Old Testament is that you're dealing with fallen human beings that are doing things. Uh, in the Old Testament, the one thing that we have to keep in mind, so this is, I'm going to bring in a, a separate category. It's like polygamy. Did God accept polygamy? No. But did he tolerate it? Toleration and acceptance are two different things, and we've got we to know that. Uh, just because we see something happening in the Old Testament doesn't mean that that's acceptable. But it doesn't mean that it's, it's dismissive either, if I'm making sense to you. So what David does, David does. What Rahab does, she does. What others do, that's what they do in the... In the the, one of the great apologetics of the Bible is it tells us what people do, right? It just tells us, good, bad, and ugly. But what we have to do with a measure of wisdom when we're reading the Scripture, both Old and New Testaments, toleration doesn't mean acceptance. And acceptance is not for me to determine that. So we're coming right back to the truth aspect. Is there something greater? So go ahead, it can also destroy your reputation, which uh, if, you're, if you're a merchant or if you're a farmer and people are relying on you to be honest okay. in your dealings, you have, no, you have no customers. Right. And uh, you can also end up being shot by the community. You have no friends. It can be a really tough price you're willing to pay for this. It you is. No. And that doesn't even get out to your eternal soul. No. Well, and this ties into your part about a neighborhood. If you go, if somebody is willing to boldly lie in a place that they shouldn't, i.e. a court, a judicial place, then what's going to stop me from lying in the marketplace? Yeah, these things are probably worth 50 cents, but that, I think you mentioned a couple of weeks ago, the unjust scales in Proverbs, uh, but you don't know that. I'm going to charge double, but I know you can't afford it. Right, but I'm still going to charge you. Am I making sense? So it's that idea 
that if I'm willing to do this, if a person is willing to do that in a place where they shouldn't, they know they shouldn't, what stops them in the neighborhood from doing that? What stops them, you know, with, with, with whatever? So if I'm willing to do that, then it's, uh, you know, Bob, the check is in the mail. Check ain't in the mail. Bob, you don't know that, right? That's the idea. Um, go ahead. Thank you for your patience. Abraham was traveling with a lady. It was his sister. It was his wife. He chose, and I think we're told what motivated him to do what he did. Mm -hmm. Because it was, in his eye, it was going to protect them. Sure. When we take God out of the equation of what we fear, then probably what's going to happen is going to be worse than what we fear. Uh, are there any examples where, where lying is proven to be the right thing to have been done? I would say, I can think of a couple examples, I think where lying in the end made it worse rather than better. Mm -hmm. And we just rely upon ourselves instead of God. Yes, it, it's, the, it's the polygamy thing. God tolerates it. But what was any man who had more than one woman, how did it end? I, you have Hagar. Again, you have Hagar in the way that it is. It, that is one of those things. And it, it's just a moment where a decision has to be made. You know, now Abraham is making a plan as he goes. He kind of sees what's going on there. Uh, and in all of this, even if we look at it and they stumble, they fall, they sin, they're still used. The lie doesn't... Do, doesn't diminish, uh, doesn't negate, uh, maybe is the better word, Scott and then David. Just two areas to think about in this, these difficult situations. One is, there are situations in Scripture, particularly the Old Testament, where it is clearly times of war. And in times of war, <coughs> deceit is used. And, in, and if I'm not mistaken, God instructs in certain battles, ways to deceive the enemy and get the upper hand. And that deceit is a lie. It's, it's pulling the enemy into a trap. So times of war, that's a, that's a principle to think about. The other principle to think about is a hierarchy of laws. Jesus heals a man on the Sabbath. Protecting someone is a very high good. It's difficult. It's not. A, it's unsafe ground for sure. Mm -hmm. But there, there are hierarchies of good, and some situations have to. We have to make tough decisions. Sometimes. Yeah, thank you. But I'm just thinking that uh, you don't read a lot about the Rahab and the David and the Abraham about. We don't know what happened yep. in their mind after those events. They may have repented of those things. Or not. I don't know. No. Yeah, we have no idea. You know, there there is no idea. And that that is the the unsettling thing is that we would like a nice, neat little bow and we don't get that. Um, and it's easy to read into that and maybe find a justification for why I have done something or why I will do something. When the take the thing is, is let me just be as close to God as I possibly can in what his word has to say. Um, but Rahab will give an account. You know, David will. Abraham, you mentioned Abraham going down to Egypt. He will. Uh, are there real life consequences and rewards? Sure, there are. But that doesn't mean anything from an eternal perspective. Uh, Pharisees sit on the corner and they heap up praises and they get the reward in this life. Just because a reward happens or something good happens doesn't mean that's the case. Uh, very quickly, go ahead. We should just concede you're not going to get through this. <laughs> <laughs> we refuse. But, <laughs> but mine's not about that. Mine's about the, the neighbor idea. Do okay. they see the neighbor idea the same way? Or maybe they, maybe they should have. But and not that you could bear false witness against a neighbor. right? But do they see neighbor the same way Jesus explained it in the New Testament? Because... The people are allowed to have enslave other people, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and there's different things that they can do to outsiders that they wouldn't do to each other. Yeah. And so is the each other the neighbor really? At this so moment. Then, so yeah. Their at, idea of neighbor is. At this moment, your neighbor is your fellow Jew. Right. Now, as it's developed, 
the foreigner becomes your neighbor, the stranger, you know, as it's developed, as it goes along. Did they see it at this moment? No. The hope is, is that they will learn. Right. That's the idea. Well, the question is raised and asked of Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Right. And we have a lesson on that. We do a whole story yeah. on who that is, which tells you that all the way down, they struggled with that. Which, yeah, so they should have done good to people that needed good done to them, but, but there were also these... <laughs> <laughs> there were also these like situations where the rules were somewhat different. Well, they are, and I would even say the New Testament echoes that a little bit with do good to all men, but especially those of the household of faith. Not that you know, you're know you more important than someone else, but there's maybe a, a greater obligation in that. Um, very quickly, uh, just kind of to make it for ourselves, uh, just to move along and cover the material, I had a question, what has truth become in our society? And, and I know that it has become my truth. It's become relative. It has just become subjective. So instead of submission, it, we've gone another route with another S word. And it's become sub, uh, subjective. Well, then if it becomes subjective, then anything can be a truth. If I say it. Right? Regardless of whether there's empirical evidence or not, I can say that. That's right. It's true for me do what's best for you, things like that that we have always heard, but within the last 50 years with postmodernism, we have just taken the bull by the horns and run away with it. Um, so now that becomes a lie. And of course, I had on there defined lie. What is that? Uh, so we got ahead of that question. So we covered that already. Um, but all of this, even when it comes, I was going to mention, even Satan doesn't tell a whole lie. Right? And you go into the New Testament, and he is the father. You mentioned that, Michelle, that he is the father of lies. He's been lying from the beginning. And Proverbs 6, which I, we're not going to have a chance to look at, but that is something that we do need to know in the book of wisdom. There are six things that the Lord hates. Seven are an abomination to him. And I know we talk about all sin is equal in what it does to us spiritually, and that is true. But not all sin is equal in what happens to us in this life. Or others. You, that's a good point. Tor, which is the emphasis of your neighbor. So if I don't see you as my neighbor, if I don't treat you as my neighbor or vice versa, then it's going to be harmful. And that's the point. That if you do this, you don't reflect Yahweh, but you're bringing more harm than good on the society that he's trying to build through you so that you will be a light to the nations around you. So if everybody just does what is right in their own eyes, based on what they think, and never go outside of themselves to settle that, then you have what we've got. And what do we have as a society? Chaos. Book of Judges? Yes, sir. Two times. It's, that's the commentary of the Book of Judges. Uh, and that's the point. So very quickly, what does, I want to take it to the angle of us and our responsibility with truth. I would hope we would know, don't bear false witness with your neighbor. But the New Testament, starting with Christ, sharpens that even further. And he doesn't leave it in a courtroom. Don't bear false witness to your neighbor who you work with or who you work for or who you live with or who you go to church with or who you walk with or do whatever with. And so real quickly, Bob, you mentioned this from the character of God and Scott. You did the same. Hebrews 6, 18, it is impossible for God to lie. It is impossible. Why would those of us who follow him. Take that into our character. I'm not saying that it's impossible for us. <laughs> We're human. But why would we actively seek out that type of characteristic? Matthew 15, 19 through 20. 
out of the heart, Jesus will say, comes all sorts of things. But among the list are falsehoods. We look at the adultery, we look at the greed, but embedded in that is the falsehood. And by the way, it would be nice for all major media to acknowledge that it's the human heart that's what's wrong before we start going to outside things. Matthew 5, 37, he will quote this in this section, verse 31 through 37. You have heard it said, you do not bear false witness. I say to you, you shall keep every oath that you make. I'm paraphrasing. He takes it out of the courtroom and just simply says, if you told somebody today you were going to do something, do it. Because if you don't, guess what you just did? That's, wait a minute. Whew. If I told you the check is in the mail, but it's not in the mail, what did I just do to my neighbor? I bore a false witness to him or her. Jesus doesn't, I mean, he drills it down to, you mentioned the motivation, Michelle. He drills it down to the heart and makes me confront, why do I say and do or not do the things that I say? What is going on with me? He would tell me that one of the reasons why I would bear a false witness, whether it's to me and Eric or me and Dennis or to whomever it may be, part of it is just because I don't have integrity. I don't have integrity. Oh, integrity matters when I'm writing a contract or signing a car note or a mortgage. But integrity matters when you spoke to someone today and said, I'll have it to you by the end of the day at work. That's integrity. Right? Uh, Ephesians 4, 25 and 29. We know Ephesians 4 because it says speaking the truth in love. You know what Paul will say? Put away all falsehood among each other and speak the truth to each other. It isn't just that I speak the truth in love. What good is love if I never speak the truth? What is love without truth? What is, I mean, but even he will say, just even within the church, put it away. If it can't be put away among God's people, Folks, we're not going to put it away out there among those who are not God's people. So uh, you've probably heard me say this, and I've got one more verse, but you've heard me say this because I've heard it from a minister before, and it's just always stuck with me. If we're God's people, we should be trilingual. We should speak love. We should speak thanksgiving. And we should speak truth. We should be trilingual. Every day we should be able to speak those three languages to our neighbor. And if we can't do that, that's a reflection on his character, who he is. So 1 John 1, 8 through 10, perhaps the one that we need to stop bearing false witness to is ourself. You want a good study? Go through the New Testament epistles and find out how many times the writers say, do not deceive yourself. And yet, how many times do I bear a false witness to myself about things? If we do not tell the truth, we lie. And his light is not in us. That passage... It's powerful because his blood flows and he is just and willing to forgive us of our sin. But I got to acknowledge, truth's got to bring me out of self-deception. And there is no powerful deception like self-deception. So Israel, today, do not bear false witness with yourself or your neighbor. Speak love. Speak thankfulness. Speak truth. Because that's who our God is. And when he spoke, those were the three things he spoke. The class is yours.